Hello, everyone, and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today, I'm delighted to welcome back Sheikh Hassan Spiker. You're most welcome, sir. Lovely to see you again, Paul. Lovely to see you. You're in Jordan today, I think, aren't you? You're, you're now based there? I am indeed. I'm back home in Jordan. Wonderful. And, and I'm back home in London, actually, having just well, arrived here as well. Um, for those who don't know, Hassan Spiker is a philosopher and second generation Anglo-American Muslim. He spent 12 years studying the Islamic intellectual sciences in the Muslim world, primarily under the guidance of the Iraqi sage Al-Sayed Qusay Abus Al-Sid. Sorry, sorry to butcher that. Could you pronounce that correctly? It's actually difficult for even for Arabs. It's Al-Sayed Qusay Abu Sa'id. Perfect. Thank you. I'm glad you said that. Um, he sub subsequently obtained uh, his degrees in philosophy and philosophical theology from the universities of London and Cambridge, where he is also currently completing his doctorate. Now, he is the author of the following books, Things As They Are. Um, I've got a copy of it there. Nafs al amma The Metaphysical Foundations of Objective Truth. A very good book. And this one, one of my favorites, the, Met uh, the Metacritic of Kant and the Possibility of Metaphysics. And uh, that was in 2022 that was published. And most recently, Hierarchy and Freedom, an examination of some classical metaphysical and post-enlightenment accounts of human autonomy. This is a really excellent book as well. His okay. next book, um, yes, there are more, um, Transgenderism and the Assault on Human Nature, Navigating Modernity's Endgame, is forthcoming. Now, today, Hassan has kindly agreed to discuss uh, his new article titled Transgenderism and the Violation of Our Angelic Nature. It's an extraordinary title. Published in the uh, new edition of Renovatio, the Journal of Zaytuna College, a, a Muslim liberal arts college in California. And I have my, uh, this is the current journal uh, edition. And Hassan Spiker, you can see his name there. Uh, the article appears in this. Uh, we both have our own copies, hot off the press. And um, I'm going to link, by the way, not only to uh, the journal below, but also to the article from the journal, which you can read for free. And a um, little plug for this uh, extraordinary journal, by the way. Uh, the current edition has some amazing articles. For example, one of them, The Untold Stories of Enslaved African Muslim Women in the Americas. Uh, the Untold Stories of Enslaved African Muslim Women in the Americas, an extraordinary account uh, of of this. A lot of this history has been airbrushed away. It's been recovered now. Um, another one I really, uh, one of my favorites as well, what walking can do for our souls. I love walking. What walking can do for our souls, what a fabulous uh, title. Um, so I'll link to uh, this as well, where you can get uh, your own copy. Now in the article um, Hassan's going to be uh, talking about today, um, he provides, I think, a truly devastating philosophical critique of certain ubiquitous materialist ideologies that demand a radical rethink of traditional concepts about gender, sexuality and the family. And how Hassan sees these as premised on the assumption of a godless universe. And he critiques in this article such seminal thinkers as Karl Marx, Frederick Engels, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, and Judith Butler, and notes the egregious impact their thought is having on our society and calls on us to what he calls, quote, the healing and liberating truth offered by the tools of the Islamic tradition, end quote. So over to you, sir. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wonderful. Um, so, transgenderism and the assault on human nature, mm. um, which is the title, in fact, of the forthcoming book. So, I'll set out straight with this quote from quotation from John Stuart Mill. He says that theoretical philosophy, which to superficial people appears so remote from the business of life and the outward interests of men, is in reality the thing on earth that most influences them and in the long run outweighs every other influence. Wow. And I just want to highlight this quote because the approach I'm taking in this presentation in the article and in the book, inshallah ta'ala, is 
a little bit different from what may be familiar from the gender on discourse, the very voluminous gen uh, discourse on gender. Did I just say gender on discourse? Discourse on gender and transgenderism that is currently flooding the internet and academic publications and so on, newspaper articles, because those treatments and the discourse tends to be very, very highly charged in a political sense. Mm. It's really an argument between left and right. It's an argument between the liberal and the conservative, between Democrat and Republican. Um, I always like the, the saying, I think it's very apt, that the conservative person is that person that thinks and acts in exactly the same way as the liberal, just slower. <laughs> and this is the problem. Mm. It's the kind of impasse of the contemporary discourse. It's very tribal. It's, well, I'm going to be on this team. You're on that team. Why? Well, neither side is able to provide very good reasons. It's really moralizing fundamentally um, mm. and political partisanship. And that can really only take you so far. I think the way to break the impasse is to realize that the claims made by transgender you know, ideologues and proponents of gender fluidism are truth claims. They're either true or false. And they actually rest upon a very long philosophical genealogy and, 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 and pedigree of really quite linear influence between key thinkers in the emergent mm -hmm. modernity. Yeah. And so this is the hope with the work that I'm carrying out on transgenderism, that it will empower Muslims and other interested people to really come to their own conclusions about this extraordinary new phenomenon based on the real philosophical arguments that, that underpin them. Mm -hmm. And as Mill's saying here, you know, we, can, we dismiss philosophy at our own peril because we will be influenced by philosophy by that trickle down, whether we know it or not. But we can either have someone else doing our metaphysics for us, blithely unaware of what's going on, or we can participate in the conversation ourselves. So the first phenomenon I'd like to discuss here, which I think is really, really integral, is the transferal of the attributes of divinity to the free, self-determining individual knowing subject the transferal of the attributes of divinity to human beings as being one of the fundamental philosophical drivers of, going, of what's going on today. And it sounds like hyperbole. It sounds like exaggeration. It's really not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is precisely what's going on. And, and inshallah, in what follows in this section, we'll, we'll substantiate that and see exactly how that works. Yeah. So... Just to illustrate this principle, there's a little quotation from the article. So transgenderism, which I'm calling the central sacrament of the religion of dying postmodernity. And I asked the question, why is opposition to gender fluidism singled out for such focused, violent and vituperative attack rather than other possible obstacles to radical self free self-determination in defiance of authority, such as opposition, opposition to, say, incest or euthanasia? Yeah. Why is the doctrine of the plasticity, fluidity, and instability of gender imposed with so fervent and anxious a frenzy worthy of the Inquisition? Mm. It is because the act of sacred transmogrification constitutes the supreme right and indeed sacrifice of the religion of dying postmodernity a religion that represents the dramatic finale and death throes, the veritable Gota Damarang, I think that's the first time I've ever said that, of the Western <laughs> intellectual tradition itself, you know, the twilight of the gods. I had to look, I had to look that up because uh, Gota Damarang from Wagner's opera is at the ring. It, mean, it means the twilight of the gods, the death of the gods, basically, in Absolutely. German. It's a German word, obviously. Yep. Of Sorry. the end, so it's, it's a, it's, no, thank you. It's, it's the twilight of the gods of the Western intellectual tradition itself. Yeah. Yep. Reverence for the communicant, 
that is the post-operative transitioner, and celebration of his, her, their sacrifice, for they died to their dead names for the sake of our freedom, becomes a quasi-theurgical sacrament, a sign by which one's self-creation might alone be worshipped, such that one's true status as, as unrestrictedly, ontologically free becomes finally revealed before our very eyes as soul and unquestionable absolute reality. Wow. So you're, you're really just, I mean, it's very, very clear here and explicit. You're characterizing this phenomenon as a religion with all, all of the, 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 the rights and the ideologies and the talk about the communicant and reverence and new creation is very Christian in a, in a way, isn't it? The sacrifice, uh, so it's a paganism, it's like Christian overtones there, but it has all the fervor and the encompassing uh, worldview of a religion in, 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 its, in its metaphysics. Extraordinary. Exactly, and that's a good point you make because it comes directly out uh, and only out of a post-Christian milieu. Mm. And I think that's very significant. Yeah. So this is one of these key figures here, yes. Ludwig Schwerbach. I mean, this is one of these philosophers' philosophers who kind of lurks in the background. Yes. He's hugely influential on Nietzsche, Marx. Hugely influential on Marx, of course, and hugely yeah. influ influential on Freud. Yeah. In his notion of projection, which we're about to discuss. I didn't, I've never seen a photo. I didn't know there was a photograph of the guy because he was, this is like early 19th century, but it's actually he's a photograph. It's the first I've ever seen one of him. But anyway, all these I years. Think there might be a couple of others, although I can't tell whether they're photographs or paintings. But this one definitely seems to be a photograph. Yeah, that's a photograph. Cool. I've never seen that. Yes. So uh, this, this is his, his essence of Christianity, his very, very famous book yes. in which he advances, advances his immensely controversial thesis, it must have been in, in I think, the 1940s, yeah. um, which is that rather than, when I the bill, it's an awful, awful thing to say, rather than God having created man in his own image, it's actually the reverse. It's mm. man, when I the Billah, who's created God in mm. his own image. Well, can, can I, sorry, can I just go, go back to that? Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just can't um, resist the uh, opportunity to um, uh, note translated uh, from the second German edition by Marianne Evans, or Mary Ann Evans, who, of course, is better known as George Eliot. George Eliot. Oh, of course. Is, no, I didn't notice that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she was. Very, she this is what she did. She used to translate uh, extraordinary radical German biblical scholarship and radical German theology, like Feuerbach. But she actually became famous in Victorian England as the author of Middlemarch and Mill on the Floss and all these amazing. Oh. But Middlemarch, this book by her, because she she was actually not a man. She published uh, uh, um, uh, as George Eliot, but obviously she was a woman. Um, but because of the, you know, the prejudice of the day, she decides to have a man's name. But George Eliot's book, uh, Middlemarch, is, is usually seen as the greatest novel ever written in English, in the mm. English language, in English literature. Mm. Is that impo important? But she had this yeah. sideline, in, and she herself, by the way, was an atheist. She, she had mm. read this stuff, become radicalized by it. She'd read Feuerbach, she'd read Nietzsche, she'd, and so on. She became radicalized, and it caused a bit of a scandal in Victorian England that she was known not to believe, it, not to believe in Christianity. Anyway, mm. that's another subject. I, I couldn't let it pass. Marianne Evans, one of the greatest novelists in English literature in history, also translated this uh, egregious text. <laughs> Absolutely, and she was. There's a very sad story of her unrequited love for Herbert Spencer, and she was uh -huh. very much mixing in those radical anti-religious yeah. circles. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, but I just thank you. No, thank you, thank you. Um, so this is a quotation directly from the essence of Christianity. Yeah, I was looking over it recently, trying to extract the kind of pith of it, and um, I think these two really do it. Hopefully, so he says the divine being is nothing else than the human being. Or rather, the human nature purified, freed from the limits of the individual man, made objective. So we're falsely objectifying, we're maximizing our human attributes, yeah. and we're falsely reifying it in an external being called God. This is what Feuerbach is teaching us. Yeah. Yes. I.e. contemplated and revered as another, a distinct being. All of the attributes of the divine nature are, therefore, attributes of the human nature. Man, this is the mystery of religion, projects his being into objectivity, makes it into an object, 
So the subject makes himself into an object and then again makes himself an object to this projected image of himself, thus converted into a subject. So he makes himself an object, as it were, looking through God's eyes that he's just created. Mm -hmm. He thinks of himself in an object, is an object to himself, but as the object of an object, of another being than himself. So we're jumping now to a statement of the fundamental change, which is really crowned by postmodernism. We'll fill in lots of the gaps as we proceed with different sections of the of the discussion. But this is a this is a kind of summation of the influence, the end result, the logical end of the principle that we've the principles that we've just seen expounded by Feuerbach. And it will give an indication of just how influential Feuerbach has been, Feuerbach has been, and just how the extent to which via Nietzsche, via Freud, and via Marx, his views have actually shaped the intellectual establishment. Yeah. So this is from a book, Deconstruction in Context, is actually the introduction. And he said, I remember encountering this once in the UL in the Cambridge University Library years ago and being really, really struck by it. So he says, in the wake of Descartes' meditations, modern philosophy becomes a philosophy of the subject. This is one of the first steps. The locus of certainty and truth. Subjectivity is the first principle from which everything arises and to which all must be reduced or returned. With the movement from Descartes through the Enlightenment to idealism and romanticism, attributes traditionally predicated of a divine subject are gradually transferred to the human subject. Through a dialectical reversal, when over below the creator God dies and is resurrected as the creative subject. As God created the world through the Logos, so man creates a world through conscious and unconscious projection. In different terms, the modern subject defines itself by its constructive activity. I mean, I, 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 sorry, just just to protest slightly here. When I when I studied Descartes Univers University, his, his, his meditations, I, I, I was I was very struck how you where this the, the the centering on the subject, the cogito. I think, therefore, I am. That became the certainty in Descartes' epistemology. What he couldn't he couldn't doubt that he was doubting. But mm. he then went on, and this was missing from the course, and I knew it was missing because I'd read the meditations before I went to university, is the, the ontological argument where he, he's, he sought to reestablish the truth of God's existence, the creator God's existence, through pure reason, and mm. there, thereby guaranteeing the efficacy and reliability of our sense perceptions of the world, which he had called into doubt through methodological skepticism. But my point is that D Descartes himself wasn't an atheist. He, wasn't, he, was yeah. the, he was theocentric, ultimately, in his concerns but they've been lopped away it's, it's been kind of minimalized or ignored in west in the subsequent philosophical tradition i discovered um so he's been misrepresented to some extent by ignoring the theocentric aspects of his philosophy so what you're reading there is true but i'm protesting that a descartes has been str strong armed through this to be made out to be something he really wasn't he didn't oh, believe uh, uh, yeah. I think it's unfair on Descartes. He, he, for him, the, the supreme subject was God, but mm. his epistemology in the way he did it centered on the subject, the I, the ego, the ego, and I think therefore I am. And thus, mm. that's why he is used that way by people. Absolutely, and I, I totally agree with you. And Descartes is a, br a brilliant philosopher. People focus in on the meditations, but he considered his most important book to be Principles of Philosophy, which is a, mm. where it was a a metaphysical and physics textbook and absolutely as you say we uh, we we associate him with methodological skepticism but he wasn't yes. a skeptic at no, all his the methodological proce skeptical <laughs> procedure was simply to affirm absolute certainty to find exactly. that absolutely certain so god, so god god himself guaranteed the reliability because god is good and he wouldn't deceive us and absolutely. therefore uh, the way we perceive the world is actually reliable and that was the fundamental epistemological foundation of his worldview but you wouldn't kind of know that reading that paragraph although what the paragraph says is true there's, there's a way Absolutely. Descartes has been used in, in a truncated form to for this movement that you're describing yeah. Absolutely and it's the way he's been used and I think it's it's a consequence really of what they call the Cartesian split 
Yeah. And so it's this idea that there's a radical bifurcation between subjectivity and objectivity. Mm -hmm. And what's out there in the world is just extend, extended substance, is just yes. mathematically analyzable body. And therefore, it almost drives a wedge between man's subjective appraisal of the contents of his own mind and exploring that subjectivity and this kind of hypostatized external yeah. world, which is just extended, it's just mechanical, brittle yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think, yes, that's the way that he can be misused yeah. and has yeah. been misused. I think he has. Thank you very much for tolerating that. <laughs> no, uh, it's very enriching. Please um, continue to interject and enlighten us. You're very kind. Um, so we're going to go through various different mm -hmm. stages and, and, um, and sections in order to try to get to grips with these metaphysical foundations. But I think before we proceed any further in that, it's just probably a good idea to recap and summarize basically our, our present situation. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, the dominant mainstream views which are now being really enforced frankly as i think we're, we're all becoming increasingly aware on really the normativity of gender fluidism um mm. so the inversion of sex and sexuality so my contention here is that the the place that we've arrived now which is the denial of sex and the sense of gender and as mm. we've discussed there's no real distinction no mm. but there are stages. How did we get here? There are stages by which we arrived at this very odd point, which seems so unintuitive, but nonetheless, something about the underlying logic, the false logic of it is appealing to people. So how do we get here? So, you know, the West in the last 60 years now, really, it's since the 1960s and the sexual, so-called sexual revolution has progressively, well, progressed, it's developed towards this point. And what's kind of surprising about the transgenderism movement is how quickly that suddenly accelerated, mm. really, yeah. within the last 10 years. But there's really a very logical uh, sequence here. So it starts out with the normalization of heterosexual promiscuity, yeah. which we find in the 1960s, you know, the hippie movement, free love, and so on. Yeah. Um, you know, the UK led the way, you know, free uh, provision of contraceptives on the NHS, uh, laws to do with abortion, laws to do with censorship. Um, and so this entails the rejection of the category of sin. If mm. one is, if we're normalizing heterosexual promiscuity, then we've thereby rejected the concept of zinna. That means there's no such thing as zinner. Yeah. One is free to choose one's sexual partner. And we're talking about ordinary, normal sexual proclivities at the moment, normative sexual mm. proclivities. Mm -hmm. within, even within that realm, there's no such thing as sin. Yeah, it, used, it used to be called, when it, when it, when two, a man and a woman who were not married lived together, used to be called living in sin. And this is very common. And this is a criticism, and not meant ironically. This was a serious kind of moral criticism of, my God, they're living in sin. And that mm. actually existed. I, I remember even as a child hearing this expression. It's completely disappeared now from any oh, I've, I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. I think children growing up in in the West, you know, it's this race, as you know, for people to lose their virginity in secondary schools. It you know, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. They're becoming used to promiscuity. Um, it's cool to sleep around, um, to have sex with as many people as possible. And it is this race for young people. And, and very few people are accepted. And those who are usually feel very left out. Unfortunately, that's our present reality. When I was 14 in year eight in a very normal school in Cambridge, a girl got pregnant um, at the age of 14 and had to leave the, the school. And um, you know that was in the 90s. Um, and things have advanced, if you want to call it advancement, a great deal since then. But the point is, how do we move from the normalization of promiscuity to the denial of heterosexual normativity? Well, it's exactly in this idea of the rejection of the category of sin. Because you then think, well, if there's no such thing as sin, 
surely I should be free to extend my desire to whatever I feel like. There's no sin anyway. So if promiscuity is acceptable and it has nothing to do with the heterosexual premise of that promiscuity, but it's rather than just the free exercise, really the arbitrary exercise of one's sexual desire, then why not extend it to something else? Because it's simply another object of desire. One can desire whatever one wants, part of one's freedom. So the moral neutrality of the extension of desire to other forms of promiscuity, it's all simply a matter of choice. So the next phrase is the, the next stage is the denial of heterosexual normativity. And this is something that Foucault, as we'll see, was very, very big on. Um, and in fact, let's go to this little quotation at the bottom, which is from um, Butler's, Judith Butler's uh, very, very important book, Gender Trouble. Um, she says, Wittig concer uh, concurs, Monique Wittig, however paradoxically with Foucault, in claiming that the category of sex, as in gender, would itself disappear and indeed dissipate through the disruption and displacement of heterosexual hege hegemony. hegemony. So wow. how does this work? Right. And of course, we're not saying it really works in reality. We're saying there's one can glean a certain false logic that has led people, has led to the widespread sense of the plausibility of these changes. So mm -hmm. why? It's because sexuality no longer presupposes an opposite gender, an opposite mm -hmm. sex. So one is freely discharging one's desire, regardless of of, of, of the object of desire, it doesn't matter. What matters is one's freedom and the fact that one has desire and wants to, wants to realize and fulfill that desire. So in sexual practice, in sexuality, in the, the free exercise of sexuality, I don't know if that's the best way to express it, but anyway, in the free exercise of, exercise of sexuality, the integrity of the genders no longer plays a defining role. Mm. It's not relevant what happens to be the object of that desire. It's certainly not within a binary of uh, male and female and an opposite gender. And the point is not that everyone has become a raging homosexual, but, what, but, it, but it is that it's the denial of heterosexual normativity which becomes widely, widely accepted. And the point is the assent, the acceptance on a society-wide level that sexuality doesn't have to involve opposite genders. And so the role and importance of the genders becomes sidelined. It's simply one option amongst many. And so then we get to the denial of sex, gender itself. So mm -hmm. sex... Gender is itself a false reification of certain forms of sexuality. This is Foucault's famous theory. There's no such thing as sex or gender. There are only forms of sexuality. And then because of power interests, as in the need to populate uh, the state and, 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 and so to cultivate reproduction and so-called so heterosexual normativity, we need to concretize falsely this notion of sex as being a real extra mental essence where it's not what's really there are certain forms of sexuality and then we falsely reify out that our notion uh, our notions of sex of gender and this comes as we'll see later from deep philosophical roots in really in Kant ultimately but very specifically in Hegel and then in Marx which is seeing reality and intelligibility the objective knowability of the world and and the idea of essence no longer is this timeless reality whether it's a, a, a platonic heaven or the knowledge of god the timeless knowledge of god but rather as a process as an evolving process and we'll, we'll go into that more yeah uh, Hegel's big on that yeah exactly Exactly. Yeah. Hegel's, Hegel's the man. He's, he's got a lot to answer for Hegel. Um, so in any case, moving on. So what we're going to explore further now is this question of how did we get here to this third stage mm. here, which is denial of sex, which is now being propagated in schools, in indeed in kindergartens and nursery. Yes. Yes. Um, and is leading to this widespread adoption of self-identification, rather, of some 
some place on the LGBTQ plus spectrum by young people in extraordinary numbers. And I think they say that Generation Z, rather than about 4% in the rest of the population, about 20% now identify as LGBTQ. Now, they'll, of course, say that's because of the, the, the oppression of the the, 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 the false normativity of heterosexuality and the, the, the concrete reality of gender has now been lifted. And so people are now free to explore other options. And I think we, we would probably, and indefinitely, of course, uh, suggest a, a very different interpretation of that, um, of that phenomenon. But in any case, we can discuss that more. So how did we get to this point? The, we got to this point in terms of ethical and political philosophies that need to be taken into consideration and the metaphysical backdrop as well. Now, what I'm focused on here is really the metaphysical backdrop. The ethical and political really amounts to John Stuart Mill's harm principle, which is that no one has the right to interfere in someone's own free exercise of their self-determining will, uh, except to for self-protection and to avoid harm. So everyone is free to do whatever they want to do as long as they're not causing any harm. And that is a principle that almost any person that you run into and, 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 and start discussing these issues with, uh, whether it's in England or America, they will, not to be rude, but they'll parrot this principle. There are very few who actually believe it based on philo uh, 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 that would be able to provide philosophical substantiation. But this principle is very intuitively correct. I mean, as long as you're not hurting anyone, you're free. Who are we to impose our lifestyle on you? And we shouldn't interfere. And, and that includes moral censure. We can't say that you're doing something objectively wrong. We can't say that this um, uh, phenomenon and, and these beliefs, and whether it's active homosexuality or it's uh, tr uh, transitioning as a transgender person, are wrong or, or unnatural or not in accordance with nature, because that's to give a moral judgment. That's to to treat these things in terms of a theory of the good. And everyone has their own theory of the good. And there's no way that we can impose one theory of the good on others. We're, we're free to adopt our own theory of the good, but there are no objective theories of the good. So it's basically John Stuart Mill's harm principle and it, it becomes further um, detailed and, and finds different applications in, let's say, uh, Berlin's distinction between positive and negative liberty, I mean, these are things perhaps for another time or another speaker. And I think probably you've had someone on, you've had so many, so many extraordinary meetings um, talking about these features of political liberalism. Um, and then, of course, rules and, and uh, you know, his original state and all of that stuff. And it really goes back very quickly just to the kind of Lockean empiricist assumption that one can't root an objectivist ethical theory, moral objectivism, in one can't provide metaphysical foundations for any such theory on empiricism. Because on empiricism, ethical and well, ethical and, and, and moral properties are simply not empirical properties. And there's no way even in principle to root them. Um, in any case, and, but, but what I'm focusing on here is the metaphysical backdrop. Now, one of these most important um, uh, principles, again, is this idea that we've, we've discussed earlier, that intelligibility in essence is as processes rather than instantiations, that rather it's the contention that intelligibility in essence is are processes rather than instantiations, instantiations of timeless objects of divine knowledge. Now, this is presupposed, and one we've already seen, which is the transferal of the attributes of divinity to the free self-determining individual knowing subject. So this, the one we're looking at now is a later development. What it presupposes is this, intelligibility in essence is as processes rather than instantiations of timeless, timeless objects of divine knowledge. 
So one of the very, very key figures here is this rather majestic figure, <laughs> dark figure, Karl Marx. Indeed. So let's have a look at what Marx says. So, so again, I mean, I think is an extraordinary manifestation. This individual is a very, very extraordinary manifestation of what the, uh, uh, a, a um, corroboration of what the quotation that we saw from Mill at the beginning, which is people think that theoretical philosophy doesn't really matter. It's just a luxury that ivory tower intellectuals in, indulge in. Well, the ultimate figure who proves that wrong is Marx. I mean, look at how he... <laughs> yeah. he transform the world um, on every level as the direct result of his philosophy. So in any case, so this is coming out of a, of a section of the article. Um, so we're talking about the rejection of essences, the rejection of essences, the rejection of the idea that beyond subjectivity, there is a real world which is distinct in itself, which has intrinsic real intelligibility, real knowability, real objective knowability. And in a way to know the world is to receive in a, in, with a definitely a, a passive, not a solely passive, but a passive dimension to receive intelligibility from the world because it's actually there. Whereas what unites these various views which underpin transgender theory is the idea that there's no real world out there beyond the construction undertaken by each individual human being subjectivity. So this reached its culmination perhaps in Jean-Paul Sartre's justification for the casting aside of human nature altogether, namely mm -hmm. that existence precedes essence. Now we'll go into that in the next slide, but it was his spiritual master Marx and he really was his spiritual Marx, uh, master. I mean, Sartre had huge reverence for Marx. The spiritual master Marx, who had previously explained that religion is, quote, the fantastic realization of the human essence, exactly because, quote, the human essence has no true reality. Mm. For, quote, man is no abstract being squatting outside the world, and he's lampooning metaphysical theories of forms or whatever it happens to be. Yes, so j j just, I mean, the language he uses, there, the word squatting outside the world. When I came, come across squatting, uh, is it kind of a, a, scat a scatological metaphor? <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it implies a revolting kind of debased activity. Yeah. It's not a neutral description, but the subtle influence of his language here in degrading a certain metaphysical perspective is extraordinary. He was a master of English or German. I don't know if you're in German or English here, but he was very clever in the use of language in the way it affects master of rhetoric. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. He was a, you know, it's, it's uh, something I wanted to point out. Marx is a master of rhetoric. We should, we mustn't underestimate these figures. They're very, mm. very dark figures, but we mustn't underestimate them. You know, I've just downloaded Marx's 55 volume collected works. Wow. I was trying to find the, the treatises where he really, which are real technical, theoretic, theoretical, uh, mm. philosophical treatises. And I was really taken aback. He is an absolute master of philosophy. I mean, I found it very difficult to keep up. When, he, when he's outside of, I mean, he wrote for newspapers, he wrote for journals, he wrote lots in lots of different mediums. But when he's doing technical philosophy, he's actually very yeah. frightening. He, he studied uh, philosophy at the University of Berlin. Um, he was a young, he was a, a fan of Hegel, uh, a young Absolutely. Hegel. Absolutely. And it's actually his, his exposition of Hegel that I'm particularly talking about. Right. I mean, the, 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 the young Marx yeah, the young Marx was very philosophical, but yeah, he, he was a trained philosopher. Um, he Absolutely. Was a yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's worth bearing that in mind. There's more to this than just the rhetoric, you know, the sigh um, of the obsessed soul and all of that and the opium of the matter. Yeah, the the yeah, yeah. yeah, so he says the human essence has no reality for man is no abstract being squatting outside the world. Man mm -hmm. is the world of man, yeah. the state, society. So there's exactly this inversion. It's I, I, I was so, I was so seduced when I, sorry, no, when I first read this I, 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 as a teenager, I was seduced by this. Man yeah. is the world of man. The states. Are, I thought I had an epiphany when I read that. Yeah, of course yeah. he's right. And I became a Marxist by by, by seduced by this language. Thank Absolutely. God I'm not a Marxist, but it's a powerful effect on a naive, young, immature mind. <laughs> Mine it's wasn't. Very it? seductive and. 
you know, when Marx wrote these words, its time had come. Yes. Because of the metaphysical backdrop of, yes. of Kant and Hegel and Feuerbach and so on, yeah. this made sense. Yes. It yes. made sense. If you didn't have access to some great tradition, traditional philosophy or something, and you were very much within the, the, yeah. the contemporary milieu, this made sense. This was getting at truth. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He, so he says, for Marx, uh, sorry, so I say actually, for Marx, there is no essential human nature. Instead, there are only, quote, historically specific forms of human nature. That is, human nature specific to feudalism, to capitalism, to socialism, and so on. And this, of course, is dialectical materialism, which is a you know, dialectical process, which is a, an inversion of Hegel. We'll discuss that. Unless the Soviet attempt to create the new Soviet man, which was literally trying to create a new human nature. But on the basis of this, you have a human nature specific to feudalism, capitalism, etc., and then communism. But of course, it failed because you can't re you can't create these. Uh, man is not plasticine like that. You can just mold D uh, De Novo out of nothing, and so Absolutely. it failed and became a totalitarian state. Where you anyway, I digress. But there's very important. Have and that's, just, that's what they found out. I mean, that's what it didn't work out for them because it, it didn't work out came up against reality. Exactly. Sorry. So he's, he goes on. Indeed. The real nature of man is the totality of social relations. Yes. So it's this extraordinary inversion. It's hard to exaggerate yeah. how influential, as you, as you said, this formulation has been. It's seductive. It's, it's what yeah, un underlies Sartre. It's what underlies what we're going to see from Foucault. It's what underlies, it is what underlies Butler. And it's the idea that we falsely concretize and reify yeah. these natures, these essences, Whereas what it, all that is real is the world of flux, the world of becoming, the world of process, of change, and of what they call the dialectical pr process. And, and, and evolution, because Karl Marx wanted to dedicate his great work Das Kapital to Charles Darwin and actually wrote to him apparently and said, can I dedicate my, my great work, my magnum opus to you? Darwin said, no, thank goodness. Oh, that's but, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness he said no. Can you imagine? Um, but the point is, of course, that Dharma was about processes as well. So this was in the air. This was the zeitgeist. This is 19th century England where Marx and Darwin both lived in London, of course. They were both in London at the same time. Um, it was part of the zeitgeist. And, and that's, I think, that's why it had a credibility uh, and its time had come, as you put it. Uh, absolutely. And, and apparently when Darwin received The Origin of Species, he was absolutely delighted and thrilled and radiant. And he said, this is... Just my philosophy in the realm of biology. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Apparently. So, um, so this is um, this is an extraordinary phenomenon. Is this idea that reality, and that, as you say, becomes very, very widespread, and, and people like Darwin and people like Herbert Spencer in so many yeah. different realms, that reality is fundamentally this flux. It's this material unfolding, this process. There are no real natures there. What is there is this struggle. This this um, this this state of, of perpetual becoming and never being, um, and uh, as such, this the, what what we think are distinct timeless essences of human nature and the family and and God and and gender and so on are really constructions. They they are human acts. They are human activities. Um, so in any case, we'll see this in 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 lots of um, uh, in, in many of uh, of Marx's descendants. So the real nature of man is the totality of social relations. A consequence of Marx's views on human nature was that he likewise tended to view nature uh, gender as a dynamic concept capable of further development. This is because since both nature and society are not static entities, there can be no transhistorical notion of what is natural. Instead, the concept of natural can only be relevant for specific historical circumstances. So I'm not going to go into Hegel very much, just very quickly, because I, I think you know, it's really important um, to, to be aware that there's no Marx without Hegel, and there's no Feuerbach without Hegel. And sure, they will point out that that they are refuting many aspects of Hegel and they're moving beyond Hegel and they're, mod they're, they're modifying Hegel's philosophy yep. and they're even opposed to Hegel. Um, but this is one of these things that one has to be very careful of. You know, sometimes people 
come up very proudly to you and you say, no, it's not, existentialism's not relevant anymore because it was, struck, it was replaced by structuralism and then that was replaced by post-structuralism. And you know, sometimes people just want to show that they, they're very clever and they know lots of different philosophical terms. But the point is, there is no, there is no real difference between these. There is a, this common thread of intelligibility that you can pull all the way from Kant, through Hegel, through Feuerbach, through Marx, yep. uh, into Sartre, um, into uh, then Foucault, um, and then um, uh, Butler and, and so on, and the really extreme postmodernists. Um, so this is actually a kind of trick. We think, well, no, existentialism isn't relevant anymore. It's gone out of fashion, which it certainly has, having been the most fashionable thing in the universe in the 1960s. But the reality is there would be no Foucault and no Butler without Sartre. And there's no Sartre without Marx. And there's no Marx without Hegel. And of course, Feuerbach, we mustn't forget Feuerbach, he's very important. So Hegel's basic theory is the following. His basic theory is what governs reality is this dialectical process of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And this is what is really fundamental to reality because it's, it governs the real nature of reality, which is to be becoming. Reality is purely a developmental reality. It's a reality in flux, which changes and evolves very, very importantly. So he'll start with, for example, the notion of being, pure being, that God is absolute being. And he'll say, this contains, this is a, a thesis, but it contains a contradiction, right, which is the antithesis. It contains a contradiction because the whole point of pure being is to be completely indeterminate, right? If it's if you say, well, pure being means all of the determinate things. No, those are determinate things. So, you know, the computer in front of me, the divine name on the wall, the curtains, all of, these are all determinate beings. They're determinate instances of being. So when we say our starting point in philosophy and the true nature of God is just pure being, which is outside of determination, it's outside of the world, he'll say, well, that, that contains a... That's subject to the dialectical process. That contains a contradiction. Why? Because in order to understand being is, we have to understand pure being is, we have to understand its opposite, which is pure nothingness. So pure being is not pure nothingness. But pure being is the indeterminate. It's the completely indeterminate. Well, that's exactly what pure nothingness is. Pure nothingness is the completely indeterminate. So then, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to play host to these contradictory notions and we make progress by going to the synthesis. The synthesis is, well, no, there's no such thing as pure being. All there is is becoming, right? All there, all there is is becoming, which is determinate beings, not being itself, it's determinate beings existing in relation to one another, undergoing, uh, uh, undergoing this temporal process together, right? So everything is in time, everything is temporal, er everything is subject to time. But then there's a further stage, which is, well, the further stage, which is, well, determinate being, the notion of determinate being also contains a contradiction. It's self-negating, right? It's this very, very Hegelian, it's self-negating. Determinate being is self-negating because it's only intelligible, it's only has reality by, in terms of being determinate, by being not other than itself. And I'm gonna stop very soon, don't worry, for anyone who's, for, who's, getting, who's getting a little bit lost. Um, the, the, the determinate being contains its own negation because what it means to be a determinate being is to not be other, is, 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 to, is, to, is to not be, uh, is to be other rather, sorry, uh, than other determinate beings, right? So 
the very idea of determinacy has to invoke the idea of other determinate beings. And those other determinate beings are in this state of constant struggle and war against one another. All of these determinate beings, because they're finite, right, they are always pressing up against each other and basically locked in this struggle for, for survival. Because the determinate being can only exist in the conditions, right, of, exact, for example, I mean, the, the exactly right physical circumstances and conditions and variables which allow us to exist uh, on Earth, for example. All of those factors, all of those variables are also themselves determinate beings which have their own finitude and their own sense of uh, 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 dependency on everything else, right? So the point is, everything is is negating itself ultimately and devouring itself just by being finite because it's trying to self-actualize and there's no way that it can fully self-actualize we have a finite lifespan we are subject to all of these environmental and personal and social constraints and limitations which press upon us. Everyone else also wants to get their piece of the pie, also wants to make their own way in the world. And so this constant struggle, and this is exactly the dialectical procedure. Mm. Um, so there are no essences for Hegel in the, set, in the traditional sense, which is really universal to traditional uh, civilizations, whether one is a a Christian Thomist, or one is a traditional Platonist, or one is a, let's say, a Muslim Avicennan, or a, or someone who's who adheres to various for, forms of Kalam, that in the intelligibility of the world, the reason that the world is objectively knowable and their real essences is because that intelligibility and those essences are not contained within the individual, within the determinate instance those are just merely instances. They presuppose that timelessly those essences exist. They are actually prior. The intelligibility of the world, the essences that make up the world, yeah. actually exist timelessly prior to their emergence in and what, what, yeah. what we can call the, re the, the realm of becoming. And there's a debate about, because Hegel identified as a Christian, of course, in his day in 19th century Berlin, where he was uh, a very esteemed professor of philosophy, of course. Um, but what kind of Christian he was is debated. Was he a, a pantheist? Was he a panentheist? There's a distinction, of course. Uh, but he certainly wasn't, I don't think, uh, in any way an orthodox Christian in the Lutheran Actually, sense, no. let alone yeah. in the Thomist sense or anything like that, because mm. of what you said, uh, the, the Geist, the spirit, it was very much imminent in the process of history itself. Uh, and, and, what, and what Marx famously did, he inverted Hegel's uh, whole metaphysical structure, if you like, turned him on his head, as he put it. And, and uh, that's another subject, from idealism to, to matter, material processes. Exactly. Really, um, but anyway, that's very, no, that was very clear, Hassan. Thank you. Very interesting. That's very kind of you, Paul. I, 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 um, I found what you said much clearer, and I, I, I wish we'd just stuck with what you said. It was only about 10 sentences, uh, 10 words, and it was yours. Exactly. Because you probably understand it much more than I do. But in any case, moving swiftly on, let, let's yeah. go to the, um, to the, if you don't mind, sir. Oh, no, I can do it. Oh, yes, oh, I, 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 uh, no, indeed. Oh, 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 oh that, was, yeah. that was a picture um, of Sartre there for a second. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mm. So we've done Marx. Um, Marx yep, is a version of Hegel. He keeps the yep. centrality of the dialectical process in existence, but it becomes a purely material process. Um, and oh, there we go. Yep. Jean Paul Sartre, yes. Marx student. Indeed. So we are proceeding along our journey towards understanding what's going on today in terms of transgenderism. And another very, very key figure is Jean Paul Sartre. Just want to mention, by the way, for those who don't know, uh, he died in 1985. He was fr a Frenchman, a uh, Jewish Frenchman um, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, of all things. Um, but a very uh, one of those great French intellectuals, <laughs> um, incredibly famous in his day. Uh, um, there's still footage of his funeral, I think in 1985 in Paris. Hundreds of thousands of ordinary Parisian, Parisians 
lining the streets because in France, of course, philosophy is, uh, you know, a popular subject amongst the general population, not just a ivory tower pursuit. So he was very famous uh, as a political activist, as a dramatist, a playwright and a philosopher, amongst many other things. Anyway, that was just to say who he was. He wasn't German, he was French. <laughs> yeah, so it's the, it's the German and the French. It's those, um... Yeah, it's the... Um, oh, this is this is this uh, existentialism and humanism? Oh, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. I was just going to say, let's not risk a, a British joke about the German French. In any case, um, what do we mean by saying that existence precedes essence? So this is Sartre's mm. very very famous um, principle statement, which is very much associated with. Um, yeah, in that book. Yeah, I, yeah. I, was, I was just to say, I just dig, dug this out for my bookshelf. This is my old, dirty copy of Existential Humanism uh, when I was about 16. Um, I read this, and uh, briefly I became a disciple of Jean-Paul Sartre uh, in, in my head. Yeah. And uh, again, like Marx, very seductive. Uh, I found him very seductive as a Absolutely. teenager anyway. Yeah. And th this horrible old copy, which I've not touched since, and I will probably bin ultimately because I'm not going to read it again, um, having sucked the marrow out of it. And I'm, I, I know what he thinks and I don't agree with it anymore. <laughs> but um, you could auction it because that looks like a... Like well, a for a couple, couple of P, a couple of dollars. Yeah, it won't, be, won't even be yeah. worth that. But... Um, if you must read it, do read it. It is it is readable, um, uh, but uh, it is important in terms of the genealogy of the situation we're in, the the pedigree of the ideas, as you put it, of, of how we get to where we are, is to understand people who author things like this back in nineteen published in the nineteen forties, just after the war, actually. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and this is indeed from from that very readable existentialism and humanism, which is it's yeah. not from from being in nothingness, where he goes into this in more oh, detail. No, it's much, it's much more readable. If you, want to, want yes. to, if you don't want to torture yourself by reading Being in Nothingness, <laughs> I'd suggest it, existentialism here is much shorter. About 1% of the length of Being Nothing is about four inches thick. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's this famous principle uh, yeah, that existence precedes essence. Yes. Essence, And you would have, you know, 1960s students at their demonstrations, they would have been you know, excitedly parroting this principle. Uh, probably having no idea what it meant, meant. but um, in any case, we, we mean that man, first of all, exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world, and defines himself afterwards. It's very akin to you know, the, the, the process from the concept of pure being in Hegel to uh, finding that there's a, as, there's a tension there, and then we, be we become determinate, right? So if man, as the existentialist, sees him is not definable, it is, be to be it is because, to begin with, he is nothing. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary form of nihilism, nothing. It's also John Locke's blank slate, isn't it? That we have no human nature, we have, we have no particular humanity, we, 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 are, we are formless, we, we are nothing, and only mm -hmm. in our being thrown into the world to use uh, you know Heidegger language, do we oh. become something? Um, oh. Because it denies our, I mean, obviously Islamically and in terms of Abrahamic faith, it denies our created nature, our fitra. This oh. is all hellish stuff because it it it, it robs us of our birthright is to be creatures uh, of the Creator. But and I don't want to anticipate what you're saying. But no, yeah, it's, it's, and can I just say that? Um, can I just say that it's a common mistake, I think, to believe that somehow there's this very, very stark difference. They're just you know, never the twain shall meet completely different things, you know, British empiricism and this continental style philosophy. It's not the case. There are mm -hmm. a lot of empiricist uh, assumptions um, in, you know, even in this very different stream. John, John Locke, it, it, this is pure. John Locke could have, well, anyway, it's another subject, but anyway, I'm not going to go there. Okay, let's, well, in, in that case, we'll, I'll go on reading. So he will not be anything until later, because he's just said to begin with, he is nothing. Exactly. He will not be anything until later. And then he will be what he makes of himself. So it's the construction yeah. of human nature in every case, and every individual is to construct their own human nature. Thus, there is no human nature because there is no God to have a conception of it. Because there is no God. It's denial of God is the heart of this. Precisely. When I the villa. But what I find extraordinary about this is Sartre really did understand philosophy. Exactly. And he understands that he is rejecting that traditional 
metaphysical framework, he's, he understands that if the essence of human nature doesn't exist timelessly, it doesn't really exist at all. Exactly. And that's why Nietzsche, Nietzsche understood that point before Sartre, of course. Um, mm. Yeah. Absolutely. So he says man simply is. Not that he is simply what he conceives himself to be, but he is what he wills. Right. Mm. So it's this, again, this prioritization of the will, which is very characteristic of, of everything that we're discussing. And as he conceives himself after already existing, as he wills to be after that leap towards existence, man is nothing else but that which he makes of himself. Exactly. So then oh. we go to his consort. His part, part yeah. Is yeah, that the right no, word? What is, what is the right? I've never quite. I mean, they weren't actually married, were they? I don't think. No, they weren't married, and they they were early proponents of the of the open relationship. So they were living. In, I, sorry, just to clear, they were living in sin. Then we need to be clear on this. They were living in sin, and they thought it was all right to allow. I mean, they they, they didn't mind multiple partners in that. So they oh, they, they were they were early proponents of what what now of course is called the open relationship, very famously. So um, anyway, his partner, I think that's right. Yeah. Wow. Now, she's very interesting because now there's, she's the last step before we get to explicit yeah. transgender theory in Butler, right? So she builds and really presupposes, she modifies certain things, but that shouldn't blind us to the fact that they're fundamentally the same. Uh, she presupposes Sartre's philosophy and that of Marx and that of, of Feuerbach and that of Hegel and so on with modifications. I'm not saying they in any way they wholesale adopt uh, Hegel, Hegel's philosophy, of course they don't, but with, with you know, the continuity of certain key principles. Yeah. And her very, very important contribution to all of this is her distinction between sex and gender. Yeah. And so what you'll find today, so again, it's, it's very much presupposing this kind of bifurcate, this, you know, this almost Cartesian split. You know, sex is anatomy and it's really very boring and it's just physical it's just physical formations, um, and they're really neutral in terms of interpreting what they are. This is the whole point. Everything else is interpretation, and that's what gender is. So sex is not a determinant of gender, right? Gender is your self-presentation in terms of certain human patterns, certain human properties, of usually in terms of femininity and masculinity, and the traditional understanding is there is no real distinction, right? What they are calling gender are simply the social manifestations and concomitants of, of sex, of being either male or female. But her, her distinction is very important. It comes out as a theoro theoretical uh, uh, presupposition of her feminism. And so she's also a very good writer. Oh, she's very good. There's a wonderful interview. Uh, you can see it. I saw it on YouTube a few months ago. It's in French, but English subtitles. She's been interviewed by oh. this fairly fawning young kind of Parisian journalist, where she explains all this, but she does it in in a you know in a way that you know very, very impressive in terms of her eloquence, her charisma. Oh, yeah. uh, quite seductive again if you're kind of naive enough to just buy into this whole philosophy. But yeah, uh, again, she was uh, Sartre's equal in many ways. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, very, very much so. So, mm -hmm. if the publication this is from the article that if the publication in 1990 of Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, which we're going to get to next, marks the watershed moment for the gender fluidity movement that dumbfounded readers in the first decades of the 21st century, Sartre's ca consort partner Simone de Beauvoir's pivotal 1949 work, The Second Sex, was its seed. So, this is all in this very tumultuous, uh, immediate post-war period where everyone's kind of what's just happened i mean what's come come of human nature the the terrible crimes that have been perpetuated the names of these uh, ideologies and so on and it's a very it's a it's a, a time where people are very very susceptible to, to something radical and new especially if it has this kind of ethical coloring um but in any case Sartre's concept simone de beauvoir's pivotal work the second sex was its seed so it's the seed of all of this transgender. It doesn't explicitly develop it, but it's, it's, there's a very clearly traceable element. So in the imposition of coercive liberalism on the manipulated individual in the creation of a tyrannical majority, the repudiation of human nature and the complementarity of the sexes is a key article of faith. So it's very important to believe that there's no human nature and that there's no real complementarity. 
between the sexes. That's all oppression. That's all power interest. That's all yeah. uh, false projection. So the, the, the Beauvoir's famous opening lines are a telling summation of her project. Again, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, almost akin to what we saw from Marx. It's very satirical. It's very, um, she is really mocking these traditional institutions. Is femininity secreted by the ovaries? Is it enshrined in a platonic heaven? Again, what we just saw from Sartre in terms of, you know, there's no, con there's no real human nature because there's no God to have a concept of it. When, when I like, Is a frilly petticoat enough to bring it down to earth? Although some women zealously strive to embody it, the model has never been patented. It, was, it is typically described in a vague and shimmering terms borrowed from a clairvoyance vocabulary. So it's this, this sense, this implication that people who are talking about real essences, they don't have epistemological humility. Um, they think they're clairvoyant somehow. They know everything. They can penetrate into the real essences of things. And this is depicted here as very implausible. In St. Thomas's time, it was in essence defined with as much certainty as the sedative quality of a, pop uh, a poppy. But conceptualism has lost ground. Biological and social sciences, so it's the invocation of the authority of modernity. The reader has no idea. I mean, in most cases, won't have any idea about the details, but they'll go along with it. So it's a new form of authority. The biological and social sciences no longer believe there are immutably determined entities that define given characteristics, like those of the woman, the Jew, or the black. It's probably appealed to the emotions there to say the Jew or the black. Science considers characteristics as secondary reactions to a situation. So again, it's this inversion. Reality is no longer the instantiation of timeless principles, but rather it is the process itself. And then we construct the, you know, the timeless interpretation, the, the fixed interpretation uh, 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 as a free creative act on the basis of what we observe. If there is no such thing as femininity today, it is because there never was. Does the word woman then have no content? It is what advocates of enlightenment philosophy, rationalism or nominalism vigorously assert. Women are amongst human beings merely those who are arbitrarily designated, designated by the word woman. Well, yeah, it's quite packs a punch. I mean, she's I, really I, 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 do protect, I mean, even Richard Dawkins, the the arch uh, atheist, but nevertheless professor of science in some way, you know, is doing the rounds on YouTube and some other platforms these days, asserting the biological realities of gender. I mean, he, he's now gone from you know uh, from being this this risque anti-establishment, anti-religious figure, now actually upholding the verities of biological fact that we our species comes in two binaries, male and female. Um, so what was she saying here, biological social science no longer believe there are mutable determined entities. Well, that may be true of social sciences, but it ain't true of biology. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. Um, although I would have to say that I find ultimately that kind of you know, hard-headed common sense rationalism, which really has nothing to do with the rationalism of people like um, Dawkins, um, is actually ultimately less consistent than, let's say, Sartre and, and Beauvoir. Why? Because Dawkins does have a, a degree of metaphysical naivety when he says such things. True. Um, because the fact is, built upon the undoubted physical substratum of, of, of gender in the sense of, of sex in the sense of gender, um, there are the, what you'd say in Arabic, the ma'anawi, there are the intelligible dimensions. The, 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 you know, the fact that femininity is not really construable as a biological entity. Right. It's a Maranui entity. It's an intelligible entity. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, someone like Dawkins has no account of that whatsoever. He's got, a, he's, crude, he's got a crude materialist understanding of this. And you, you have a much more nuanced metaphysical understanding. Yeah. Well, exactly. And the thing is, I think for all his pretty evident failings, Sartre <laughs> at least does understand that. Hmm. He, yeah. he understands what he's doing. Oh, yes, he does. Now, this is very true. Yeah. Like, just like Nietzsche, I mean, they knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. Whereas other people, I mean, I mentioned George, uh, George Eliot, Marianne Evans. She carried on living a quasi-Christian life and speaking Christian morality in her novels, even though in her heart she believed. All that. And she was criticized by Nietzsche, uh, by name, for not mm. working through the implications of her atheism in the way he had done and the way that Sartre came to do as well. So you can yeah. be someone who doesn't really wrestle through philosophy like Marianne Evans is accused of not doing, but Sartre mm. and Nietzsche did. Uh, mm. and, and that's why they're so 
this is almost heroic. I say almost because they're not really heroes at all. <laughs> but mm. there's al almost something heroic about their fearless consequentialism. We're going. We'll go to the pit with our views if necessary. Yeah. We will, and and that's probably where they are. <laughs> Sadly, it's, it's it's difficult to. Um... Uh, to disagree with you. So, of course, de Beauvoir is at pains to point out that woman does exist. She exists as a social construct. Mm. She does exist it's just as a social construct. As she tells us, one is, now this is a very famous statement of hers, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. Now you can see how there's, there's, there's uh, there are barely any steps left now to where we're, we're to, to the present day. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. With this thought, we encounter the ne plus ultra of so-called self-determining individual freedom, which has been this fixation, really, yeah. of, of, of post-enlightenment Western thought from Kant onwards. And it's yeah. advanced contemporary reading. Although one is surely an individual of a nature, in the sense of essence, but not to be constrained even by one's nature. Because the nature is not real, you know, it's the it's the totality of social relations or whatever formulation one chooses. It must not be thought that in the in this process of self creation, however, one escapes one escapes the web of social construction and somehow penetrates into reality. It doesn't mean you're getting at reality. No. Instead, once the last most persistent and unyielding essences, pseudo essences, falsely reified, falsely concretized essences, are finally banished, such as gender nature and human nature, all become social construct. Butler, the doyen of contemporary gender validism, goes much further than de Beauvoir. So we're now, we finally got, got there. Employing de Beauvoir's distinction between sex and gender, Butler holds that it is not merely gender that is a social construct, but sex itself. Right? And that's why what we consider to be self-mutilation, that, that sacred transmogrification is actually possible, and it's real. So... Oh, I thought we were getting to Butler. Sorry, That's he got in the way. He got <laughs> <laughs> He's always getting in the way, Foucault. That's yeah, he is nowadays. I'm afraid he's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Um, yeah, so we're going to have to deal with this. My least favorite part of it, but anyway, the, we get to Michel Foucault. So this is from the last chapter of his very famous history of sexuality. Um, this is the the last. Sorry, in his last chapter of his first volume. Um, and this is really his flagship idea, his flagship, his like pivotal contribution to this whole downward spiral. Um, and it's, it's usually not easy to pinpoint and what, what was Foucault actually saying? What was his actual contribution? Mm. It just seems this kind of very highfalutin, very kind of conditional sophistication for sophistication's sake, but it is possible to glean a real, very, very distinct contribution to to the development of, of gender fluidism theory. Um, and so he says, he says, it is precisely this idea of sex in itself, which he doesn't accept at all, by the way, that we cannot accept without examination. He thinks it's a fiction. He's about to say it's a fiction. Is sex, and this is in the sense of gender, of course, is sex really the anchorage point that supports the manifestations of sexuality? Or is it not rather a complex idea that was formed inside the deployment of sexuality? And we alluded to this earlier. This is his key idea. And again, it's the same Hegelian Marxist inversion. Practice and process are primary. Those are what are real. We construct fixed realities out of them, but they're not what's real. Mm -hmm. So what's real is the deployment of sexuality, which is fundamentally in itself neutral. It's arbitrary. It doesn't mm -hmm. presuppose sexes. It actually creates sexes in the sense of genders, with the help of the exercise of power interests, mm. right, of the state or whatever, who wants, you know, to create this idea of, you know, the, this, what they would consider to be the, this, this very crude, you know, merely traditional idea of the family where there's, you know, the monogamous, monogamous um, uh, uh, you know, um, man and wife who who uh, stay together forever and, and raise a family, and this is the natural state of affairs, and so on. That's actually for him a false reification, which is the result, as, as implausible as it sounds, which it actually, I think, even sounds very, very implausible, that it's purely that, even if mm. we were, for the sake of argument, purely to admit that it was partially due to power interest. But you know, the, the state, you know, over thousands of years, the powers that be falsely reify these concepts because they want to encourage 
certain forms of sexual relationship um, for their own to further their own interests. So, um, but he says what's real is the deployment of sexuality. That's just the practice of sexuality, people's proclivities, their their sexual practice. Uh, which in itself is fundamentally new, neutral and arbitrary. We think it presupposes the opposite genders, but for him it doesn't. I mean, it's I important. Mean, I, I know this is kind of the genetic fallacy, but I, I, I can't help but think that he himself, Foucault, was, as he would put it, a gay man who was, was known to frequent the um, certain places in San Francisco, uh, uh, which transmitted HIV, and he died of AIDS. I mean... Yeah. I, I mention all this not to to blacken his name or something, but but this yeah. kind of chaotic, anonymous, promiscuous, detached, you know, his his lifestyle, his very mode of living, complements in the sense of you know fits together with this kind of outlook. And I don't. What I'm trying to say in mentioning this is that's not a coincidence for me that the, mm. the, these these two reflect each other in some way. His chaotic lifestyle, which led to his demise. Um, is reflected in some way in his theory and vice versa. There's, a, rela there's a relationship between them. And, and to, to detach the man from his work, I think, is artificial. Absolutely, I agree with you. And um, I think that it's, 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 you know, if one finds out certain facts about um, Foucault's later life, and I wouldn't want to darken our discussion by going into them, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mystery that he hasn't been... I mean, prima facie, it's a mystery that he hasn't been cancelled. Well, we can, we can say because it, it's public knowledge that he he had he, he had a he had a, he had a taste for shall we put it young very young males exactly um, yeah. and th th this is not this is known uh, and why hasn't he been cancelled is a very is a very good, good very good question um, it's a very good question he's another one of these people who are too big to cancel so much rest yeah. upon him. like Darwin who was a raging racist so was Kant yes the, the the ascent of man or is it the descent or the ascent I can never quite remember which way around it's it is yeah. the descent of man yeah. uh, which, which which I've got and read uh, contains you know stuff that Hitler would have quite easily incorporated in Mein Kampf if he if he bothered well, he, he did um, actually yeah oh he did. <laughs> it shows how how badly of um, aware I am of Mein Kampf. But the, my point is that Darwin hasn't been cancelled, and yet he was an, ex an outrageous racist. If you want to read his stuff, it's quite extraordinary. Well, he's uncancellable. I he's mean, un it didn't actually come out recently. I know it was just suppressed because people can't. You know, it's again, it's back to this secular religion. It's really there are certain individuals who uh, are seen to. I mean, let's say they had. I mean, those things will be interpreted as kind of foibles. You know, he was just a man. He was a product of his time, and you know, you can't be blamed for that because he's too big to cancel. We can't. Um, you know, if we're to if we're to eliminate Darwin, um, then we don't have the whole basis of our modern worldview. And we and if we if we our materialist worldview, and if we if we um, if we eliminate Foucault, then all of the you know whether it's whatever it happens to be, whatever activists cause, whatever woke cause it is today, but certainly this crowning um, uh, instance of that uh, deification of the self-determining will, which is the... the no, although I agree with you, I, I think that there's a great irony in this, to drill on Marx for a second. Marx wasn't just... Um, uh, to Karl Marx, by the way, wasn't just that Darwin was a racist, Marx was as well, particularly about Jews. I mean, oh, yeah. he read, he read, I mean, this is the irony because he was Jewish. Yeah. Uh, you know, his father and grandfather's a rabbi, and and yeah. yet he wrote on the Jewish. He wrote a book on the Jewish question, and he recycled the most anti-Semitic tropes imaginable in his own writings. He didn't have to do it. I mean, he was, you know, a refugee in London. He no one was forcing him to write this stuff. Um, exactly. But he did. So he's eminently cancelable, I would have imagined, along with Darwin and along with Foucault. But hey, they're not they're not being cancelled, which is odd. But anyway, you, you give exactly. me a I mean, in a way it's odd, and in a way it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, you you are right. Anyway, so. wonderful. So next one, um, oh, this is again from the final chapter of his very very famous book, The History of Sexuality. Uh, uh, sorry, keep on saying it. Final uh, chapter of the first volume, the notion of sex. The creation of this notion of sex in the sense of gender, as far as he's concerned, made it possible to group together in an artificial unity anatomical elements, biological functions, conduct, sensations and pleasures, and it enabled one to make use of this fictitious, and he's coming out and saying it's fictitious, this fictitious unity as a causal principle. So again, it's a, it's a critique of, of metaphysics, it's a critique of sex as a metaphysical, as gender as a metaphysical principle. 
which at the end, when we finally get past all of these people, um, these rather unfortunate people, that, that, that um, you know, may Allah guide uh, Judith Butler because she's still alive. But um, um, we'll, we'll finally get to the, a short exposition of a more positive way of looking at this, which is gender in the Islamic tradition as a metaphysical principle. Good. So, uh, an omnipresent meaning a secret to be discovered everywhere. Sex was thus able to function as a unique signifier and as a universal signified. And then another place, on the contrary, sex is the most speculative, most ideal and most internal, ele internal element in the deployment of sexuality organized by power in its grip on bodies and their materiality, their forces, energies, sensations and pleasures. So, he wanted us to free us from these false restrictions so we could return to almost a state of nature, which is this arbitrary deployment of sexuality and that's why he thought it was before earlier yeah and that and what you've just highlighted there in green could almost be autobiographical in his experiences in certain places in san francisco you know the, yeah. the, the, the bodies their potential their forces energies sensations pleasures brackets i'm not going to say because it's a bit haram but but you know mm. the, the, it's almost a fr i think freud <laughs> looking at this thinking hmm there's a subtext here about his life yeah. <laughs> uh, it almost yeah, seems clear yeah Autobiographical. If you know a bit about Foucault's life, this is almost autobiography masquerading as theory. <laughs> now, that, that's really, uh, that is, is the view. impression you get from reading him very, very strongly. That he's very. It's. It's. Um, there's something very visceral, almost desperate, almost sexual about the way that he's writing. Right. Um, and um, uh, I was just about to say, you know, this goes back to what we saw. Uh, towards the beginning of our discussion which is that he 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 predicted almost and he, i think he's proven to be right i mean whether it's a self-fulfilling prophecy or not i don't know but he he saw that if we could challenge the normativity of heterosexuality that would ultimately lead to the disappearance of the notion of sex itself as a as a you know, fixed essence type of thing. So that's just very interesting to bear in mind. Yeah. Um, so we finally get ah, to yeah. our last figure, Judith Butler. Yes. Yeah. Who I, I didn't realize when I was writing the article was probably physically about 200 meters away from me because he not only lived in Berkeley, but in Berkeley Hills, which is exactly where I lived. Um, uh, I saw a, a video of hers very recently at the University of Cambridge, uh, hosted by the university with the the sociology department banner behind her and another banner. The university loved her. And I'm thinking this is Cambridge University promoting Judith Butler as if she's some kind of secular god. Oh, right. absolutely. And those are two very, very key centres. Cambridge is a very, very key centre of this whole movement, and as is, um, of course, Berkeley. Yeah. And then again, I mean, just to be clear, because I think it's Islamic akhlaq, you know, we have nothing against her as a person. I didn't really deliberately you know, choose this not... Um, this especially, especially flattering photograph of her where she looks like a kind of dark lord. Um, uh, in fact, my, my, my daughter came up to me while I was making this presentation. She said, oh, daddy, that looks like Voldemort, but with his half of his face. <laughs> no, really? Half of her face in the shadows. <laughs> oh, my goodness, man. I've got nothing against this person. She's a human individual. As you know, We have nothing against people who identify as homosexual, uh, as transgender or, or, or anything. Her case as a lesbian, she does identify as a lesbian, obviously. Yeah, as a lesbian. Yeah, I mean, yeah. This is not, and, and this is not some sort of, you know, fearful disclaimer. I, 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 I'm not worried about any of that. I mean, for one thing, I suppose I have the luxury of living in Jordan, but, um, but it's just, I think, uh, Islamic akhlaq, because the, the whole point is this, a real false reification, which is the false reification of the identity, as mm. if, sexual proclivity is the person i don't look at judith butler and see her as some sort of demon she's a human being mm -hmm. human being like us and um yeah i, I ask that allah guides her away from these um these beliefs which are, are hurting her ultimately and hurting so many other people in any case um as we have seen judith butler is unpersuaded by such self-evidence Having confirmed the distinction between sex and gender, she's not even prepared to acknowledge that we are born a particular sex. She sure. tells us she's following Foucault and the self-proclaimed lesbian materialist Monique Wittig, I've read quite a lot of her works, um, and she was very highly influential again on, on Butler, when she says, the demarcation of, an of anatomical difference does not proceed, imagine stating this, does not precede the cultural interpretation of that difference. It doesn't precede it. 
but is itself, you know, a baby's born, right? You, what do you, you check to find, yeah. find out what gender it is, right? For her, that, that demarcation that you are positing mm -hmm. there, yeah, right, yeah. using alien language, it doesn't precede the cultural interpretation of that difference. You think it does because that's just what's normal, but it doesn't in reality. But is it in itself an interpretive act laden with normative assumptions? I mean, this is stuff that people are filling their heads with now. It's, it's really worrying. <laughs> that infants are divided into sexes at birth, which it points out, serves the social ends. Again, it's the social ends. It's the, uh, uh, the, the power interest, the social ends of reproduction. But they might just as well be differentiated on the basis of earlobe formation. Or, better still, not be differentiated on the basis of anatomy at all. I mean, any normal person, and, and I'm sort of, you know, this is a kind of a hearsay, would, would, if they understood what was just read there, would just see this as just insanity. I, mm. I mean, it, it's not, it has no, has no, nothing real about it at all. It's complete bonkers. Yeah. It's to, bonkers. Say, to, say, to say that a child's male and female is not, is not be differentiated on the basis of anatomy at all, mm. the complete and utter irrelevance of anatomy in determining the gender of a child, it's just pure bonkers. I, I mean, I, there's there's no know. better way of putting it. <laughs> and I, I'm I'm flabbergasted that people take this seriously, and that it is taken very seriously. Well, I think you know this is not anything conspiratorial. I think it's just really factual. This is a cult, right? Cults have their own internal logic. You know, postmodernism is a cult, and the whole woke thing is a cult as well. So yeah. they're not interested in objective truth because they've already a priori, ironically enough, they've already a priori excluded the idea of objective truth. Um, they don't even accept the principle of non-contradiction or basic logical principles. And the reason I find that so evil is because they've actually, they've themselves thrown away the key. You know, they, they, they can't get out of this now because... Yeah. Real logic, real principle is a way to save yourself, you know, to, to, right. to emerge from this by reasoning. Because right. there's no reasoning. This is the nature of sophistry. And this is sophistry. This is the height of sophistry. Yeah. The nature of this sophistical reason is there's no way out of it. It's, it's a circular, uh, self-justifying um, uh, argument. And that's why, I, with all due respect to those people, I'm not saying they're involved in a conspiracy, but I find those who are trying to advocate that we as Muslims should go down the path of you know, coherent theories of truth and acquiescing in whatever new intellectual fashion has, happens to be around is it's just extremely dangerous because we're actually going to shut off our, our, our own way out of this mess that so many and others you, know. What, what I like, just I hope you maybe you're going to be doing this in a second, but in, in your article, which is found in the current edition, of course, of the journal, um, the, the, at the very top of the page, this is your article, uh, is a quote from uh, it's actually God speaking, although it's an English translation. And the male is not as the female. Quran mm. three thirty six, and and I actually posted. It was interesting. I posted this on Twitter uh, about a day or so ago, and so many people said, "Yeah, many people said," and quite understandably, when they first read this verse in the Quran years ago, they thought, "Why is God stating the obvious?" It's mm. so axiomatic. Yeah. It, w w why is God bothering to do this? But now they get it. Yeah. This is a timely word, an eternal mm -hmm. word to, to yeah. our species at this moment, that there is, the male is not like the female. So that uh -huh. this word has been waiting, in a sense, in its obviousness for all this time to suddenly make this impact. Uh, and we need to hear this word because it's rooted in transcendent metaphysical truth rather than the shifting processes of Hegelian logic. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there's a, a, bu a beautiful uh, choice of uh, quote there in your article. But, uh, anyway, yeah. mm. Thank you. So um, as we have seen, Judith Butler is unpersuaded by such self-evidence. Uh, I've been talking about certain self-evident arguments for believing mm. that gender is a real thing. Having confirmed the distinction between sex and gender, she's not even prepared for... Oh, I've read this entire slide. Gosh, we need to yes. move on. Sorry, I've been, I've been, I've been just distracting you. My apologies. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> There's so many slides. So to return to anatomy, on Butler's view, so this is a kind of refutation of what they're saying. The illusion of nature 
I mean, that they're prepared to call it that is extraordinary, leads us <laughs> to believe that our cognition of anatomical differences, in this case pertaining to the so-called genitals, they would say so-called genitals, is again absurd, entails awareness of an objective distinct reality with inherent necessary social implications. But in fact, quote, again from her, what we believe to be a physical and direct perception is only a sophisticated mythic construction, an imaginary formation, which reinterprets physical features in themselves as neutral as any other, but marked by the social system through the network of relationships in which they are perceived. There is no nature in society. From a more traditional philosophical perspective, the very fact that historical unions of these imaginary formations, these mythic constructions, have occasioned the existence of each individual in the human race, including Butler and Foucault and all that lot, poses rather a problem to their being thus characterised, that, uh, that is, as imaginary it's, formation. It's you being humorous, of course, Hassan, in a very dry English way. I think. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it's good. laughs> or mythic constructions. This is because the principle that an existent thing cannot be caused by that which is non-existent, <laughs> this is because of the principle that an existent thing cannot be caused by that which is non-existent. Indeed. One can only assume that the likes of Wittig and Butler believe that they exist, that human beings are real in that sense. Alas, for their theories, this means that these ubiquitous imaginary formations must not be imaginary after all. Indeed. The idea that there is some, this is a more general point, right, kind of summing up. The idea that there is some better, more fulfilling reality for the individual to achieve by freeing him, himself, him or herself from the oppression of nature precisely traces its ideological motivation to a sustained attack on the traditional family, which was among the most vital linchpins for the original theoreticians of constructionism and thus of gender fluidism. So if we think back to the, the sequence that we saw over going from heterosexual promiscuity to challenging the normativity of heterosexuality to actually denying sex in the sense of gender, there's another factor which is very much related to all of that, of this, and is, is in a sense uh, becomes more and more advanced, and the family deteriorates more and more as these uh, stages unfold, which is the attack on the traditional family. Um, and it's so important for us as Muslims today to prioritize the family, to uphold the family, regardless of our own status. I mean, there are so many single Muslims today and people in different. Um, situations and of course um, uh, this is um, uh, an ideal and an ideal which we all recognize but but the the family is that ship that will bear us across these stormy waters um, and it's so so important it's so important for the other side I mean sorry to put into these th those terms but it's so important for the other side to denigrate the notion of, of, of the traditional notion of family for reasons that we'll see. So the idea that there is some better, more fulfilling reality of the individual to achieve by freeing him or herself from the oppression of nature traces its motiv motivation to a sustained attack on the traditional family, which is among the most vital linchpins for the original theoreticians of constructionism and thus of gender fluidism. This arose most fundamentally from the key progenitor of gender anti-realism which can be identified in the disavowal of the notion that gender roles possess any rooting in gender nature. So another very important step on the way, for example, when it comes to the distinction between sex and gender specifically, which is de Beauvoir's very, very key contribution, is this disavowal of the notion that gender roles possess any rooting in gender nature or Gender, sex in the sense of gender nature. So, of course, if, as Marx taught, human nature is just the totality of social relations, it in no way determines those social relations because it's not there to determine them, because that nature does not exist prior to those relations. On the contrary, social relations are ripe. So that those social relations which create human nature are ripe for rearrangement, reconfiguration, redefinition, reinvention, indeed permanent revolution. Right. And once this takes place, human nature itself will ever change. So for Frederick Engels, who is, of course, you know, his great intellectual, Marx's great intellectual collaborator and friend for all of those years, and his main financier. I was going to say, because uh, uh, ironically, Frederick Engels owned factories in Manchester. He was actually a capitalist himself. Right. 
even yeah. though he was a Marxist, <laughs> he was yeah. actually a capitalist and financed uh, Marx basically for his entire life because he was hopeless at making, uh, as his wife complained, Marx's wife complained, you, you're very good at writing about capital, but you never <laughs> be able to produce any. Uh, yeah, I was about to say that, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, I'm stealing your lines. No, 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 but that's very, that's, I'm glad that you said it, we're very much on the same page. Um, he, mm. um, absolutely, that's, he, he lived in utter, and he lived in a state of constant chaos and penury, yes. um, Marx, which is extraordinary for someone of his stature and influence and yes. intelligence. So for, for Frederick Engels, who 1884, The Origin of the Family, was published a year after Marx's death, the first class struggle was that between man and wife, man and wife in the married state. And you, you, this is not some, you know, kind of distant theory. This is, you know, it's amazing how triumphant Engels' um, uh, view has been, and 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 how it has reshaped societies, including you know basic fundamental assumptions, um, you know, girl power and all of this stuff. Um, it really comes out of 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 this uh, fundamental philosophy, the idea that. Um, the, there are no, you know, real differences between women and uh, men and women. Just you know, as they rather disgustingly say, j different equipment. That's it. And so, you know, women should do exactly the same jobs as men. Um, not not the nasty menial ones, of course, like um, <laughs> uh, you know, whatever road sweepers or yeah, road, road builders. builders. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, but 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 it, it's this completely unreflective assumption or in most cases quite unreflective assumption um which which uh, and the set of assumptions which come out of this philosophy in any case so the first class struggle was that between man and wife in the married state and the first class oppression that of the female sex by the male men stood to women in the, in this relation as the bourgeoisie to the pro, to the proletariat the modern family is founded on what he calls the open or concealed domestic slavery of the wife who is forced into marriage because of the economic dependence of unmarried women on men, which is why, quote, the first condition for the liberation of the wife is to bring the whole female sex back into public industry, and, <clears throat> and that in turn demands the abolition of the monogamous family as the economic unit of society. Since in the proposed communist society, all women, uh, all children, sorry, will be raised by the whole of society, including children born out of wedlock, Moral and economic anxiety about the consequences of fornication, which is, of course, very, very strong in Victorian Britain, will no longer prevent a girl from giving her, herself completely to the man she loves, which is, of course, a very naive appeal to the emotions. Engels eagerly suggests that this would, in turn, bring about the gradual growth of uncontrained sexual intercourse, which, of course, it did. Um, and that concludes our... That rather dismal history, I'm afraid. Um, so I don't know if you'd like to come in on anything before we go to our final section. No, no, I, I, you've already, uh, I've already said too much, and um, no, I'm very, I'm, I'm very much looking forward from this very dark presentation to hearing something much more positive. I don't, I don't mean in terms of y your own. I mean, I mean in terms of the content is inherently disturbing. Absolutely. Very disturbing indeed. Absolutely, um, yeah. You clearly trace the genealogy of many of these ideas. It's really, really important to understand this, I think. Absolutely, yeah. Alhamdulillah. So to our final section, and we talked about the inversion. So what's the asal? You know, what's the, what is, in some sense, the metaphysically natural way of looking at this? So Islam mm -hmm. and gender as metaphysical principle. Now, this was mostly about the genealogy of um, uh transgender theory or gender fluidism or whatever we want to call it. Um, and I'm not going to go into the Islamic um, principles very exhaustively, but a brief overview, just so as you say, we can have a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So um, this is actually the very beginning of the article, but yeah. man is the meeting place of the angelic and the an animal realms. This is the human essence. So we span the worlds. We have this extraordinary, unique nature. We are, in a way, the barzakh or isthmus between the, the different worlds. We, the reason we can be the khalifa or steward of the world is because there's something of all of the worlds within us. In some sense, we span the world. We're kind of extended over the world in some strange way as the meeting place of the angelic, which is kind of the spiritual, the intellectual, 
dimension, the animal, which is very clear. I mean, you know, the definition of animal in our tradition is that it's a jism nami yetaharak bil irada, right? Our jism nami hasas in a in an extended definition yetaharak bil irada is very very simple. The question. Are we animals in that sense can easily be answered because an animal is a jism nami. It's a growing body, right, which is sensitive. It can sense physically. Yet a harak bil irada that can move, that can set in cell, itself in motion by free volition, by free will. That's what, a, that's what an animal is. So when we say, you know, hyoanatic, rational animal is the definition, albeit um, Aristotelian definition, possibly not the ultimately best definition. I don't think it is, but it's a it's a, it's valid for its own purposes. What we mean is that you know man is a is a hyoanatic. He's a jism nami hasas mutahadik bil irada, who's also mutafakir bil quwa, which is the meaning of natik, who um, can uh, 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 can engage in in reflection, in thought, in abstract thought. Um, and so um, that, in a way, that definition brings together an aspect, which is not at all exhaustive, but of, of our status as the meeting place of the angelic and the, and the animal. So this is the human essence. So we've just seen all of these rejections of human essences. As some of the greater, greatest philosophers of the Islamic tradition have taught us, from Raghav Lisfahani and Al-Ghazali to Shah Waliullah. Now, from the revealed law as supported by traditional philosophical ethics, we know that we do not win unto the intrinsic dignity of the actualized human essence through the sheer fact of our possession of this unique composite nature, but rather this is the whole, you know, Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Tabarak al khalaq al mawta wal hayata li sorry, Tabarak al ladhi bi yadihi al mulku wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, al ladhi khalaq al mawta wal hayata li yabaluakum, ayyukum ahsanu amala. Right? God created death and life in order to test you, which of you is best in action. The, you know, this arena is a test. That's its essence. That's what it is. People wonder, well, why is it so difficult? A problem of evil. No, it's supposed to be like this. This is the essence of human embodiment in the world, finite embodiment. It is a test. That's its very nature. That's why we're here. It's fundamentally, most fundamentally is a test. Um, and so, it's not just, you know, we don't kind of get off scot-free just because the, the meeting place of the angelic and the animal. In fact, that puts us in a very different situation because if you have a composite nature, you are then charged with ordering it. You have the free will then to order it. Are you going to allow the animal to, domi to dominate or the angelic to dominate? It's not that one or the other is, but it's not the animal becomes bad if it's dominated. It's just that it's, that's its proper place with, in respect to the, to the angelic. It's subordinate to the angelic. It's still good in itself. It has its own role. But it is subordinate to the angelic. It can't dominate the angelic. You can't, one can't have impulse and instinct, which are not bad in themselves, but they're dominating reason and intellect. That's the wrong way around. So, um, so it's not in the sheer fact of our possession of this nature, but rather by correctly ordering the various aspects, aspects of our nature through the appropriate exercise of our self-determining individual free will. And yet we are not static, disassociated, disembodied beings peering out at the world from ivory cloisters. To be a human is to be one or the other of two complementary, intrinsically complementary, mutually com uh, completing, mutually completing agents of a generative love that is inescapably and intrinsically binary. In the experience of this pr most primeval fact of human embodiment, by rule here, namely that every human being instantiates one and only one amongst two genders, an experience which each of us has simply in virtue of being human. We find that we re represent instantiations of intrins intrinsically dual metaphysical principles of, principles of generation embedded in the very structure of being. They can't be constru constructed or projected because they're actually ironically transhuman. <laughs> um, they, they, they transcend the, 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 the instantiated, embodied, imminent human state. Indeed, each human, be, human being, I don't mind using a bit of Heide Heideggerian language, there's two Heideggerian terms I love, which is thrownness and being a shepherd of being. I think those are both absolutely fantastic. It's a de de design, I'm going to pronounce it, it's de design, design. I think it's design. Design. 
assign sorry to be thrown well the idea well anyway that's a different subject but yeah absolutely so indeed each human being is thrown into one of these two roles we do not choose to be a man or a woman we're thrown into that role we find that we're a man or a woman and there is something about that findingness just to make up my own heideggerian term life uh, there's something about that experience which was intended by God. It's not something that should be played with, although I'm not happy with this. No, God intended you to be a man or he intended you to be a woman. You, you find that, that you're a man or a woman. And that was intended by God. That's, a, that, that's your, I don't mean it's your place because one is not better than the other, but it, that is your role. That is your complementary role and one has to embrace it. So, um, we're thrown into the other, but we do not choose to be a man or a woman. A further aspect of achieving human dignity thus lies in accepting God's true choice and, fulf and, and fulfilling with beautiful and beautifying excellence. Ihsan. Yeah, Hassan means beautiful. Ihsan is the form for causative, which means to do the beautiful. So that's beautiful, Spiker, indeed. Oh, thank you. Um, it's good and beautiful. I'm, I'm the good and beautiful. I'm very humble. You're good so, and beautiful. <laughs> Okay, so the role, so it's to fulfill with that beautifying and be that, that beautiful and beautifying excellence, that beautiful, wonderful Islamic term, ihsan, the role that we have been allotted precisely in having been thus created, male or female. The liberating be truth, beautiful, by the way, beautiful. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Too kind. So, this is then right at the end of the book. The liberating uh, article, the liberating truth offered by the tools of the Islamic tradition is that gender arises from both. I think this is a very strong way to counteract this line of thought. Arises from both our animal nature and our angelic nature. Because as we were saying, it does have a physical dimension and an intelligible dimension. In the sense, you know, intelligible in the sense of object of the mind. You know, femininity and masculinity, they're really objects of the mind. There's nothing, you can't really find an empirical property that they answer to, right? So in a way, that's why I was saying that, you know, the Sartres of the world are more consistent than Dawkins ultimately, despite he has this, you know, I'm just a common sense, hard-headed, rational person who believes in science. But at the end of the day, there is a lot of interpretation in science. And there's a lot of interpretation in our experience of our daily world, which is not physical and not empirical, can't be construed in any way as physical. But against the postmodernist and this whole stream of thought, we contend that, that the fact that it is intelligible it's not physical it's the object of the mind doesn't entail its subjectivity it can be mental in some way and be objective and that really is the whole point of my book things as they are and so you know, if someone wanted to substantiate that further i'd direct them there but um uh, so, just, uh, so just a quick commercial break then uh oh, thank you. commercial break i mean uh, that's the book you're just referring to so do get a copy of that it's uh there you are is available on Amazon if that is your chosen vendor. I'm not saying you should go to Amazon, but anyway, you can get it from there. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> Got to have our commercial breaks. Um, <laughs> I, I, I noticed you don't have uh, product placements like Russell Brand does yet. So, um, well, I'm not. I'm not Russell Brand. So no, he, he, he's, he's, he's very humorous. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not so jarring. In any case, um, so. The, the liberating truth is that gender arises from both our animal nature and our angelic nature. Yes, there is an intelligible nature. Yes, it's just going to be moralizing. It's just going to be the conservative doing everything that the liberal does just a bit later. <laughs> if we don't recognize, yes, there is a, you know, what's called in Islamic philosophy, a shubha. There's a doubt. That it's not just stupid that people have started thinking this way. There, there is this mystery about the fact that gender not only has this anatomical basis, but there is also this intelligible dimension. These properties of femininity and masculinity, which can't really be construed as empirical. They may have an empirical basis, or even that's kind of doubtful in, the, in, in a direct sense, but they, they may have, they certainly have an ontological substratum, we would say. But um, there's certainly a distinction between these two aspects of gender. It's just that we would say that in, in reality, they are an inexpungible unity. One can't separate one from the other in reality. Inexpungible. I love that word, inexpungible. I'm going to have to start using that word. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think I found that in a thesaurus for purposes of this, but I'm not sure if I've used it. It is a rather lovely one. I, I, I use thesauruses extensively, can't live without them. So um, uh, I wish that I was just um, a genius who could um, churn out poetry without using one. But in any case, um, uh, so it, it arises from both our animal nature and our angelic nature. Indeed, the animal nature is informed by the angelic nature. So, you know, uh, sex exists in the, in the sense of gender, exists in the animal world, but it's not the yeah. same. As, as human gender. Um, the generative love that arises from the union of the two gender principles is not merely the production of children, self-evidently sublime and momentous as that is, but the cultivation of the world through the actualization of complementary attributes that can only obtain by the intelligible rather than merely physical union of the, general, uh, the gender principles, the receptive, affective, nurturing, compassionate, beautiful feminine, a matrix of predominant, but not exclusive, which is always the immediate objection. I, I like it. You always say, you, but not exclusive twice. You did that in reference to the feminine and then and also into the masculine. And I like that because you're, you're not there by, because there is a certain sense of a spectrum here, rather mm. than two, two discrete monolithic male, female entities. So you do, you do have a, a nuance there, which I really like. I just want to say that. Well, thank you. And it, it's, it's, it's also, you know, we respect and, you know, people are on that spectrum. And there are women who, with all respect, we, uh, are, you know, have slightly more masculine properties than... Judith Butler, for example. Yeah, for example, than other, than other women. And there are men who have slightly more feminine properties, perhaps. But they are subject to this regulation by an ultimate yeah. uh, feminine principle and an ultimate masculine principle. But it's not to say that everyone has to be exactly the stereotype of masculinity or femininity. Yeah. On the other hand, restoring masculinity and femininity um, is of the greatest moment and, and, and importance. The, 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 their fundamental importance and their reality for and and for the for these for the, this for the, the very purpose that I'm trying to uh, explain at the moment. Um, so um, and then yeah, you know, the, the 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 providing, active, protecting, majestic ma masculine, a, a matrix of predominant but not exclusive attributes that supervenes on the biologically male. That is the exigencies of human nature entail that human gender comprise dimensions of depth simply not shared by mere animal nature, uh, gender, and which are consequences of the unique potential possessed by human beings to become the realized vicegerents and stewards of the world. So this is, of course, allusion to, to many, many different verses in the Quran, but the istikhlaf of mankind that we, uh, Allah Ta'ala, appoints us, Jalla Jalaluhu, as the vicegerents of the world, um, his stewards um, who are responsible for the cultivation of the world, for, for looking after the world. Um, and um, uh, many, many such verses. Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal-ard fa'abayna an yahmilnaha um, you know, we, we offered the trust, which is the khilafa, which is the stewardship, the vice uh to the heavens and the earth. Yes, I think I missed out stuff for Wal Jibal and and the mountains. For and they 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 refused to, they shrank from bearing. Them and they were afraid of it. They were afraid it was such a, a weighty, weighty vocation, a weighty charge. Mm. Um, uh, and, and man took it on. Mm. Right, it was man who. So, um, so this is what we're talking about here. So it, it's you know, unique consequence of the unique potential possessed by human beings to become the realized vice gerents and stewards of the world, the complementary of attributes that can only obtain by means of the union of mutually completing genders presupposes humankind's unique nature as the meeting place of the angelic, the animal. Why? 
It arises from our unique status as stewards of this, in which the balance and harmony we seek to effect must first be realized through the achievement of equilibrium between opposite attributes. This principle derived from the, I mean, in a way, it's because the world, before getting into any highfalutin metaphysical stuff, it's just because the world contains lots of opposite attributes which are you know, fighting one another, essentially. Um, which are at least in opposition to one another. And you know, we need to set the world in order, in balance and harmony. And that means balancing these opposite attributes in, a, in, in, the, in the proper equilibrium, proper harmony. Um, it must be achieved through the achieve, it must be a, a, obtained through the, chi- the achievement of equilibrium between opposite attributes. This principle derived from the advanced metaphysical tradition of Islam comes to the fore in one of the many later commentaries in the 14th century Muslim theologian Adil Eji's Ethics. So this is a very important work of philosophical ethics. Um, there was a myth, which I hope has been exploded by now, that the you know the Ashari normative Sunni Ashari Maturidi tradition didn't engage in philosophical ethics because they had the Sharia and that meant that they didn't engage in philosophical ethics. But actually, they they did very very much into the latter centuries, very much in the Ottoman world, particularly. There are many many commentaries on E.G.'s work and. Uh, Dorsey's work and many other works of philosophical ethics, and they they, they complement one another, the Sharia and philosophical ethics. I mean, that's maybe a, a discussion for another time. But in any case, um, so this is one of those works. So this is Al-Adin Al-Kazaruni, I believe. The wisdom underlying man having br- been brought into existence, man who is the encapsulation of all of the worlds, is that he might fulfill the divine vicegerency as is clearly expressed by the tenor of the noble verse, I'm, import, I'm appointing on earth a vicegerent, the famous verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, Inni fil ardi khalifa, and is moreover the import of the one we just recited, we offered the trust unto the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they shrank from bearing it, and they were afraid of it, but man carried it. Man's entitlement to the vicegerency is due to the perfect receptivity of his nature to opposite attributes, such that he is able to be a locus of manifestation, madhar. Not, there's nothing, this is theophanic, there's nothing pantheistic about it. He doesn't become God, but he mirrors God's attributes of the opposite divine names and accomplish the habitation, cultivation, and construction of both the outward and spiritual worlds. So this is the stewardship, is to, cult, to accomplish the habitation, cultivation, construction of both the outward and spiritual worlds. This is the final section of the... Um, both the article and the article, but things as they were, which someone at Rene Vatio, um, wit- uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, w- was very uh, witty, I think, in, um, in, in having a, a play on the title of my book, Things As They Are. Things As They Were, I didn't put that in, but I, but I like it. Um, so let us return to the healing and liberating truth offered by the tools of our tradition, for gender is merely the instantiation in the corporeal world. So again, this is the antidote to all of that madness that we were exploring. Gender is mere, What is gender? Then? It's merely the instantiation in the corporeal world of the very principle of complementarity. Why is there this thing called, you know, this is the metaphysical way of thinking. That, you know, we don't take anything for granted. So there is such a thing as complementarity in the world. Why? What is that fundamentally? It's a, it's a principle. It's not a empirical principle, really. It's not an imp- empirical, not principle. It's not really an empirical phenomenon. There's nonetheless something which is very, very, very much part and parcel of our understanding of the world, the intelligibility of the world, the knowability of the world, just the, the world making sense. We see it in terms of these abstract concepts like complementary. So it is the very principle of complementarity and generative union. Now, there are lots of different types of gener- generative union, and you know, various great thinkers in our tradition speak about this, um, that there are there is this there are these, I mean, even the first two premises of a, of a syllogism have been likened to gender principles because they, they as it were, marry one another and they produce the conclusion. Um, <laughs> literally. <laughs> so, that. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah, you'll find that in the Futter Hassel Mackey and other books. Um, according well, well, even, even Hegel's you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. <laughs> it, it is um, uh, sim- similar in a way, but um, 
I think sorry, it's really sorry to bring his name back into this. Uh, yeah, this in other ways, <laughs> very, very much not similar. But, um, but yes, um, according to certain highly influential accounts of the metaphysics of creation, God, in His absolute wisdom and freedom, ordained that the sublunary world should presuppose in its emergence. Right. By the way, this is not aqidah. It doesn't, conf you know, people get very worried about this nowadays. I don't think they did in the past, um, but uh, it's understandable. This is not aqidah. This is a metaphysical exploration of revelation, reflecting upon the implications of certain passages in scripture, aided by pure rational investigation. And, and some of our metaphysicians have come up with this. Yeah. But it's within the normative tradition, but it doesn't make it aqidah. So just to give that disclaimer, it's not like, oh, I haven't heard of that. Do I have to believe that? And I have to get worried and go and ask a sheikh or something. You don't. Um, just stick to your aqidah. That's the wonderful thing, thing about aqidah. You just learn it and you stick to it. That's it. You don't waver from it. That's why it's you, you get uh, statements of creed. And, of course, that doesn't mean blindly following it or blind faith in it. You, we should try to understand it as best as possible. But it, it saves us from having to worry. If you're reading Sartre, it's like, oh, you know, I'm, yeah, this is, am I being hurt just by reading this? In reality, is no. If you have your aqidah down very, very clearly and very, you're very strong in it, you don't have to worry about anything. Anything which conflicts with it, you just reject and that's it. And this doesn't conflict with it. So, um, so according to certain highly influential accounts of the metaphysics of creation, God in his absolute wisdom and freedom ordained that the sublunary world, our world, should presuppose in its emergence the generative union so these are transcendent, as it were, gender principles, but they're not human gender, of the supreme created active principle. So gender becomes the, princ the, the principle of activity and the principle of affectivity. The supreme pen or first intellect and the supreme created affective principle, the preserved tablet, Allah al-Mahfur, which is in the Quran. So the supreme pen or first intellect, you'll, you'll find in numerous hadith reports of, of varying degrees of, of, of authenticity. And the preserved tablet you actually find in the Qur'an, Allah al mahfuz um, The original gender principle, so as it were, the supreme pen, which is the ultimate principle of intelligibility, which has all of the universals, all of the essences, it writes upon, as it were, the universal soul, which doesn't just contain the universals, but it contains all of the particulars as well. All of the particular instantiations obtain when, when as it you know, figuratively, the supreme pen or first intellect writes upon the, um, the, the, the preserved tablet or universal soul. So scriptural language, uh, you know, Quran and Hadith language is supreme pen and preserved tablet. The philosophical language, in a philosophical tradition, is first intellect and universal soul. The original gender principles which manifest throughout the metaphysical hierarchy of being. The love epitom epitomized by these productive unions, what are called the metaphysical nikahat. So nikah is marriage, and it's also mm -hmm. you know, the act of, of intercourse um, in Arabic. Um, where, whereas um, the, the nikahat in these traditions is also used as a metaphysical principle. There are the metaphysical nikahat, marriages, literally. Constitutes the very exemplar, exemplar for the physical intelligible generation that results from the marriage of the corresponding principles of mutually complement, completing complementarity in our world, namely the union and marriage of man and woman. The cultivation of complementary properties without which equilibrium and harmony cannot obtain in this world presupposes the harmonious relationship between the sexes embody embodying their traditional gender roles. A man must maintain and protect his family. This is the final slide. That is proved to be the providing, active, protecting, majestic qawwam. There's a famous verse in the Quran, ar-rijalu qawwamun ala nisa So the qawwam is he who safeguards, maintains, and gives support. So that verse is translated something like, uh, um, Men are those that safeguard, maintain, and give support to women. The principle of affection, infial, exemplified by the preserved tablet in that understanding, or universal soul, requires that this distinctively male role be fulfilled by a complementary, be, be fulfilled 
by a complementary mode of human existence. The male active principle can only set in motion, but not himself fulfill the giving and nurturing of life. Without getting too graphic, I mean, the, you know, uh, the, the, the male sets that in motion, but he doesn't, um, he, he can't in himself fulfill the nurturing of life, which is presupposed by the giving of life. He must seek companion, or, or is rather required by the giving of life. He must seek companionship with a complementary female mode of existence, paradigmat par paradigmatically, although not solely receptive, effective, nurturing, compassionate, beautiful. Asking a woman to fulfill her role in the manner of a man who fulfills his, who fulfills his or the reverse, simply impairs the potential complementarity that is intrinsic to all human life and that every human stands in need of. Harmony is diminished thereby, the balance is broken, <coughs> the Ahmed Paul Keeler's uh, language. Mm. The brilliant Ahmed Paul Keeler. Um, yes. Also from Cambridge, a senior fellow. Also from, also from Cambridge. Now, the wisdom underlying the emergence of the genders was only the pursuit of intimate love. There's a quote from Ibn Arabi, Mahidin Ibn Arabi, from the Futuhat al -Makir. The wisdom underlying the emergence of the genders was only the pursuit of intimate love in a parallel being of the same kind, such that in the world of bodies, through this natural fusion, the perfect human being, al insan al kamil, might exist in the form that God intended, resembling the supreme pen and the preserved tablet. It's a very interesting quote, and the Futuhat is is full of of um, uh, for want of a better word, not the right word, but theorizing uh, uh, and theoretical foundations for this metaphysical rooting of gender. Gender, then, is merely the instantiation in the bodily world of the metaphysical principles of complementarity and generative union that permeate all of God's creation. Such unions are responsible for the unfolding of the degrees of being, the cultivation of the world, and the stewardship of the cosmos, in which are uniquely our uniquely human perfection, worth and dignity really lie. The very being and integrity of the world are contingent on the actualized complementarity of the genders, which are far from fluid or dispensable. Muhammad. Thank you so much for bearing with me, Paul. It was that a bit was No, you were. Well, yeah, I, I prolonged it, but um, I, I, I will link, or I have linked uh, to this article, your article in the uh, description below, uh, and, and also uh, the journal where it's from, uh, the Journal of the Ginocolo Renovatio. Uh, this is the current edition with uh, some um, other amazing articles uh, as well. It's a well. beautiful thing to have, people. I, I don't mind um, plugging this because I really believe in it. I think it's fantastic. Um, I, I've never seen any journal which is so beautifully produced. True. Production no, we, is a, a really extraordinary. It's all in full color and beautiful paper, and it's just a lovely thing to have. Yes, it is. Yes, that's very true. It's a, a, a it's itself a work of art, um, and uh, uh, yes, so th that's where the article uh, is to be found. Um, and uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, Hassan has already uh, that's his most recent book, Hierarchy and Freedom, which I do uh, recommend, um, as I do all your works actually. Uh, that's right. more on Kant, which is something more specialized. Uh, this is even perhaps even more specialized, and, uh, but also excellent as well. D do read your uh, do read Hassan's work. And w when is your um, you say it's forthcoming your your book on transgenderism? Um, what, do we have any idea when it might be published? Or um, I was thinking that it was going to be the end of October, but I realized that's not really not going to be possible. So <clears throat> I, I'd say sometime early in the new year, inshallah. Right. Right. Good. Well, I'm saying look forward uh, to that. And um, thank you very much indeed uh, for your uh, exposition of this extraordinarily troubling subject. But uh, the solutions are there if we were but to lay our hands on them. Um, we don't have to invent, we don't have to invent the reinvent the wheel. It's already been provided for us. We just need to recognize its uh, wisdom and efficacy, its God given nature for us to, for things to be well again. Um, but um, yeah, do you have any in concluding words, uh, Hassan, before we conclude? I think I've said more than enough, and I just wanted to thank <laughs> you for bearing with me. Um, and uh, Allah bless you for all of the magnificent work that you're doing. And I, I, I know there's so many people who would echo that. And um, I think it's wonderful. You're really galvanizing 
um, the Muslim community and providing us something we've never had. I mean, it's really, forgive me for gushing here, but <laughs> <laughs> you can see it, it, it really is a, an extraordinary resource now. For me personally, I mean, I, you know, I'm always thinking, when, 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 when am I... When, when am I going to have time to explore this, you know, Ali Atai's latest thing, whatever it happens? Yes, indeed. I never have, do have time to do it, um, but I'm just happy it's there. So, alhamdulillah. Yes, yeah, I know it's an extraordinary privilege to host uh, these amazing <clears throat> people such as yourself and Ali Atai and many others uh, and to provide this uh, resource for, for the Ummah. So it's a great privilege to be part of this as well. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Hassan, in Jordan, and uh, it's goodbye for me in London. Till next time. Take